Okay, good. Great. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And today our topic is Schools Out Now What? Our guest speaker is Tanya Sheckley from uh, Up Academy. She's the founder and it's an elementary lab school which values innovation, empathy, and strength and incorporates a unique neurodevelopment program for children with physical disabilities. It's located right in San Mateo on 20th Avenue and um, I'm gonna let Tanya take it from here. If you have any questions, you could put in the chat and we'll go through those. And also if you would stay muted while Tanya presents, I appreciate it. She will be sharing her screen. I'm actually sharing this live on Facebook for the first time. So hopefully we get some more audience there. And I am recording this for a replay later. I'll post it to our YouTube channel. So thank you very much, everybody. Take it away, Tanya. Thank you, Pauline. Good morning, everyone. Um, like she said, I'm Tanya Sheckley. I'm the founder of Up Academy in San Mateo. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to share a little of my perspective and the story of the school and where I'm coming from. And then talk a little bit about tips for working from home and being successful, as well as how to choose a school in the fall and how to work through some of that decision making process with all of the uncertainty in the world right now. So if you're anything like me, you hadn't planned on working from home and homeschooling throughout the spring. Um, I also didn't plan on having a startup school that, um, that had a mission and a plan that would mirror so much of the social justice and, um, and, 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 and serve the needs of almost uh, 1.8 billion kids who are now out of school. Uh, there was an article in the New York Times the other day that was talking about um, just that, the amount of kids around the world that weren't going to be going back to school. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but first I wanted to share a thought and a message and a little piece of the talk um, that I've been chosen to give as an alternate for a TEDx in San Jose. Um, so when my, the school was really inspired by my three children, and when my daughter Eliza was going into Second grade, we went through her IEP process, her individualized education plan process. And her teachers and educators at that time wanted to put her on modified grades. And I, I had a student, my daughter was in first grade. She was in the top level math classes in her grade. She was reading above grade level. She was in the top half of her class. And now I had a team of professionals who were masters in their respective fields. Um, and the heads of the school and people from the district all telling me that I needed to put her on modified grades. And what that would mean for her is that she wouldn't get a high school diploma. She wouldn't get the same grading scale as her peers. Um, it would be different and she would get a certificate of completion. And so for a child who's six years old, they were already talking about taking away her possibilities for the future. And I share this because it's something that I talk about, uh, which I call the expectations gap which is this difference in a lot of our children between what we know is possible for them versus what the expectations of their educators or of society or of other people that surround them might be. And this leaves a huge gap in between this space. Um, and I see it, and in my school, we're inclusive of students with physical disabilities. My daughter, Eliza, had cerebral palsy and so I talk about the expectations gap when I look at ableism and when I look at differences among children, but it also rings true when we look at the protests and what's happening in our society right now and bringing in the academic, economic gaps and the achievement gap, it also is partially because of this expectations gap. And so now I find myself with a school uh, that's a nonprofit that's built to serve, it's built to see the capabilities of all students um, and hope that all of our students will become successful and independent. Um, and as a nonprofit, we've always offered a lot of financial aid to really round out the socioeconomic as well as the abilities um, of our students. Um, so that's a little bit about my perspective and where I'm coming from and kind of the background of our school. So let me share with you now some more information. I'm gonna share my screen and share with you, where do we go from here? So this webinar was called Schools Out, Now What? 
let me, I'm trying to, where'd my little pointer go? So a lot of things that people have been talking about is how a pandemic is a terrible thing to waste and how many of us could be productive during this time and how many famous writers wrote their best works during a pandemic or during a shelter in place or during quarantine. Um, but for a lot of us, it also really means our mental health. So if you are one of those people who is being very productive during this time, you've found that it's a great time for you, you've found ways to use your time effectively, you've taken on new projects, I think it's a wonderful time for that, and that's fantastic. Um, and frankly, that's the, been the case for me. I've been able to take on projects that I never would have imagined taking on when I was commuting and working from school all the time. Um, but that's not everyone. And if you're one of those people who's feeling like this, who's feeling overwhelmed, who might be the mom in the family, who women still disproportionately take on the mind share and the work share of the household, of the feeding, of the laundry, of the cleaning, of the care of the kids, and still working from home, uh, I absolutely understand that too. And either one of these ways is okay. And maybe some of you bobble between both of these things, uh, and that's understandable as well. So just recognizing that and taking a moment to understand where you are in the spectrum, if it's been overwhelming um, and you can't wait for things to change, or if it's been really productive and you're wondering how we can keep things the same, uh, I hope that the next few minutes will allow you to gain some insights that will help in both of those aspects. So how do I work from home and survive homeschool? The goal is to not survive, but to thrive, right? So part one of this is creating a schedule that works for you and works for your family. Uh, I know in my family, it took us well over a month to get to a point where we had periods of time that worked for all of us and where I could really understand the blocks of time during the day when my children might not need me as much and those blocks of time that I could take for longer projects or important phone calls. Um, so creating that schedule, and, and like I said, if, if you're the mom in the family or if you're the one who's taken on the majority of the housework, um, and if your day is like mine, this really does alternate. You know, I get up in the morning, I have some time for myself, then there's a few hours where it's breakfast for the family and clean up, and then there's a block of time where I can get some really productive work done. But then there's a block of time where we're to lunch and it's distracting and I need to be with my family. And then, you know, there's another block of time where I can get some project work done and then we're on for the day. And so this looks different for everyone, but really setting up that schedule and having everybody understand at what points in the day can we work together and collaborate as a family? And at what points in the day do I need time for my projects? And do you need time for your projects? Which moves into the next piece and the next tip, which is creating a space for your children. Uh, making sure that they have the necessary supplies for their school and their camp set up. And if they're in second grade or older, if they're eight, nine, 10, they should be able to do this for themselves with, with some prompting still, um, but they should be able to set up that space, find their materials and gather all of that together. Um, and making a creative space, a STEAM space or an art space. So one of the things that I've had the ability to do during this time is talk to educational thought leaders. I've been able to launch a interview series, which has been pretty casual. Um, it's just on Zoom, but with some pretty amazing thought leaders throughout education. And one of those people was Esther Wojcicki. And in speaking with her and in reading her book, she wrote a book called How to Raise Successful People. Um, one of the things she talks about in her book was that thing she did for her kids was to put out um, creative stuff, art stuff, steam stuff, recycled goods, um, those little plastic containers that you get from takeout and some tape and some glue and some construction paper and set things up, just leave a space on a table or in a space somewhere in the house where kids can create, where they can build a project, where they can invent a thing. <laughs> um, but having that space available for them means that they won't need to be coming to you all of the time to ask what to do. Um, and the next way to try and give them some independence and create space for them is to create a snack drawer. And I put it in quotations because I, I grew up in the Midwest and in the Midwest, I had several friends who had a snack drawer and you would open this drawer and it was full of chips or popcorn or 
other things that were terrible for us, which is why I didn't have one in my house. <laughs> and maybe you don't either. Um, but creating a space where there are ready to grab snacks for your kids. Um, in my home, I cut up fresh fruit every morning. I put it in a bowl on the table. The kids know they can eat from it all day long. It's easy. It's there. They're not coming to me during those times that I could be focusing on my longer projects or be on my important phone calls. That stuff is readily available for them. So creating that space for them, creating a creativity space and creating a place for them to readily get easy snacks um, are some relatively easy things to do to set up to keep your kids occupied and give you a little bit more space to be able to work from home. So the next piece of this is schooling from home, right? And uh, I know that a lot of people have very different experiences when it came to schooling from home. It depends on the school district that you're in, the school that you're in within that district, the teacher that you have within that school, within that district, whether you're in public or private schools, it's all been very different. Uh, but one of the things I've heard pretty consistently is that students got sent home with a packet of worksheets. Maybe once at the beginning, maybe weekly, maybe monthly, but you have this packet of worksheets. Um, and one of the things that I see pretty consistently also on the parenting boards and the parenting groups are, it's been a constant fight with my child to get them to do these worksheets. And so as a parent and as an educator, I'm going to share with you, if you want to turn them into a bonfire and just make s'mores over them instead, that might actually be a better use of the worksheets. <laughs> Um, and it's one of the things that I've heard from, from other thought leaders in education as well. Um, so the worksheets do have their place and they are useful and they are, it's been our educators way of trying to continue education at home. However, the reality is that education at home is very different than education in school. And so how can we use all of the wonderful things and learning opportunities that we have at home to help our children continue to make progress on their schoolwork and on the things they should be learning. Um, so going back to Esther's book, she talks about trick, which is trust, respect, independence, compassion, and kindness. And if we treat our children and treat our students with these five character traits, um, amazing things generally happen. Uh, the thing I'm going to talk a little bit more about is giving independence. So setting up their space, creating a snack drawer, creating an art space or discovery space is about giving them more independence. And depending on the age of your children, and I'll, I'll show a little chore chart in a few minutes, but we can also have them to cook meals. I have a six-year-old and a nine-year-old and each of them is responsible for one meal a week, which means one day a week we might eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches but my six-year-old is really proud of himself and has that sense of independence and accomplishment and feels respected because he was able to cook a meal for the family. Um, so we have dogs. I let the kids walk on dogs. I let them go on walks independently around the neighborhood. I live in a neighborhood where it's fairly safe to ride bikes, especially now with the limited traffic with fewer people going places. And so finding ways to allow your children to gain more independence will help them to feel more empowered. Um, helping them to build projects, helping them to do chores around the house or finding things that they need to do to be a part of the family ecosystem will also help with that. So the next piece of that is listening to them. And this was another thing that came up consistently as I've been talking with other educators is making sure both at home now, but also as we go back to school, that's been a lot of my conversation is how do we reimagine education when we go back to school? How can we use these lessons that we're learning from students being at home, from distance learning, from having different experiences to really enhance and engage once they do go back to school? Um, and the first piece of that that I'm consistently hearing is just to ask them and listen to them. What do you want to do? What do you want to learn? And it might be, you know, for a three or four year old, it might be just, I wanna walk around the neighborhood and look at all the flowers. Or maybe they wanna walk around the neighborhood and you can challenge them with a scavenger hunt of colors. Let's see if we can find something red. Let's see if we can look for orange flowers. Let's see if we can find a yellow bird. Um, and looking for those different things 
which suddenly gives them an appreciation for nature and the outdoors and the things in their neighborhood and really allows the whole family to look at the neighborhood in a new way. So what do they want to do? Um, and can you do it? Some things we just can't make happen. My daughter keeps talking about building a fully operational life-size robot. I don't have the skills and knowledge to do that. Um, I've challenged her. She's welcome to search and try and find as much as she can about it. Um, but the other thing my children wanted to do was build a seesaw and that they were able to research on YouTube. I set them up with, you know, seesaw DIY on YouTube and they looked through a few different videos and they found one that they liked and they wrote down all the materials that they would need. So, you know, once you hear what they want to do and what they want to learn about, is it something you can do and can you set it up so they can do it on their own? Um, in the case of the seesaw, the answer was no, I can't give my nine-year-old a power saw. Not yet. <laughs> um, but I can give her a drill and I could give her other directions. And she made an incredible seesaw that both the kids now play on. Um, and this is different for every family and every kid has different wants. But especially with so much time being spent on the screen in schools, um, again, depending on your school, how can you get them off of that? How can you get them using their minds, using their hands, using their design skills, their drawing, their creativity? Um, and how can you set it up so that they actually can do those things that they want to do and learn about the things they want to learn about? Because that's what's really going to ignite their interest and that's what's going to keep them engaged. Um, and then the next bullet point here is to make sure they get outside. Um, we are all human and very much like plants. We need sunlight and water and fresh air to grow and to thrive. Um, so even if it is just a walk around the block, I know we can't play on playgrounds, we can't go to many parks, um, but just that getting outside and sitting in the sun is really necessary for everyone. Um, and then making them part of the family ecosystem. So what, what are the important things in your family? Uh, what are the things that the kids can help with? And how do we give everyone some responsibility? Like I said, in my house, each of my kids has responsibility to cook a meal one night a week. They have responsibility to put away their own clothes. They have responsibility to clean up whatever toys they played with at the end of the day. Um, so how can you draw your children in and make them understand that, yes, this is something I'm asking you to do and it feels like work, but it's necessary for the family to live in a happy and healthy space. And everybody has some responsibility for working together as a group, because as a family, we're a team. And so how do we give kids that responsibility and independence to be a part of their space and be a part of that ecosystem? So I stole this um, from another website, I'll be completely honest, but it's a nice basic list of chores that kids can do by age. Um, so if your children haven't been involved in the house, if you haven't involved them and given them this responsibility, this is something and a way to start to take some of that work off of the plate of the parents and give the kids some responsibility and independence for being a part of the family. Um, and they'll learn a lot. You know, the past few years, there's actually a course at UC Berkeley called Adulting for students who have grown up through middle school, through high school, who haven't had to do a lot of this work and they find themselves in college and living alone and they have no idea what to do or how to do it. And so giving your kids chores now will save you the money of having to pay for an adulting course later. <laughs> um, but the last and probably one of the biggest questions is what are we gonna do about school? Um, and I, I don't have all the answers. Uh, I know there was just some guidance that came out on the 5th from the state of California that were guidelines for school and school programs. Every school, every district is taking those into account differently depending on their population, their community, their ability, um, and their safety. Uh, so I don't have a lot of great answers about what we're going to do. But I can share some of the choices that we have and how to work through some of those choices. So we have the choice of going back to school in the fall. We have the choice of choosing a smaller school if the idea of going back to school with 500 other students 
and being around that number of people seems scary and overwhelming during this time. There are a lot of smaller schools available. Um, there are distance learning programs popping up. And the distance learning program is different than homeschool, where a distance learning program is going to be run by an educator. The curriculum is going to be done for you. There's a schedule that's done for you. And it makes the idea of homeschooling a little bit simpler and then it takes all of that work of curriculum planning and development off of the family as the school is providing all of that. Um, and then, of course, there's homeschooling. You can choose to go it alone in homeschool. And I've got a few pictures here of, of our end of school distance learning, a photo of this is kids back to school in Israel, um, and a photo of our original homeschooling experience. Although I will be completely honest, our homeschool table currently looks nothing like this and my children are not this dedicated when they are online anymore, uh, which may be the case in your homes as well. It, it became very scattered. Um, so I did put together a quick flow chart to help you work through some of these decisions. So looking at the top, you know, I'm worried about school. Yes, I'm highly worried about school or no, I'm not that worried about school. Um, so if you're not that worried and any schedule will work for you, you can go back and that's easy. Um, if you are worried, if you're worried about the virus and your family or yourself, or you live with an elderly person or immunocompromised person or your child uh, may have health issues and you're worried about them getting sick, that's a very real fear. And so there are some options to do from home, um, either from a distance learning or from a homeschool perspective where you're going to be still in your home and still safe, either with a curriculum created for you or one that you create on your own. Um, or maybe you're worried about school and maybe it's more because of the schedule. Many schools right now, we don't know what's happening, but they're talking about doing a part time in part time out. Maybe it's two days a week in school, three days a week at home or mornings at school, afternoons at home, which may work for a number of people. But if you have to go back to work, if you have to work full time from home, if you are in a situation where both parents need to work, that part time schedule might not work for you. Um, and so you can see here, I need an option where there is a schedule. I need to go back to work and I need my child engaged. Um, but you're still worried about the virus and you're still worried about school. So there may be homeschool co-ops that you could look for in your area that you could join, which is a small group of students taught at home probably by one of the parents. Um, or you can look for a smaller school experience where your child isn't going to be around 200, 300, 400 students, but maybe they're around 20 or 50 or 100. Um, and then, you know, looking through this again, I need to work from home, I need to schedule and education for my child, you know, maybe looking at a distance learning option if you don't want to go back to school, but you want the schedule, you want the curriculum planned, um, a distance learning option might be great. So then looking through, you know, I'm worried about the virus and somebody in my family getting sick. Again, you're, you're kind of looking at distance learning or homeschool. So this is just a very overview, very simplified version of kind of a decision flow chart of what going back to school might look like for you or for your family or for your child. And there are, of course, other considerations to take into that. You know, what is the cost of homeschool or distance learning or a small private school versus a public school? What does the schedule look like? Will it fit into your life? Will it fit into both your students' um, way that they learn best and the schedule that you need to work? How much work is required by you as the family member? Does it match your health needs and your fears around the virus? Um, and does it match your family values? And this is something I talk to a lot with families when they're looking at choosing a private school, is making sure that that school and that program and that method lines up with the type of education that you want and the type of parenting style that you're working with in your family. So if you are a parent who wants your child to be you know, following a rigorous academic course, making sure that they're getting straight A's on all of their tests, making sure that they're being tested consistently, wanting to make sure of where they stand in standardized testing, then a very progressive private school probably isn't for you. But if you're a family who's looking for your child to have a hands-on education where they're engaging experiences with the knowledge that they're learning, 
where they're really looking at building the concepts and skills needed for growth. Um, and of course, using all of the academics through that, through that system, but just looking for a different method of education than more of a progressive and less of a, a rigid, rigorous academic program might make more sense. Um, but wherever you stand in there, just making sure that any school and method matches your family's values. It'll make, uh, it'll make the transition easier, both for your family and for the school as you work together uh, on your child's education. So we have just a couple of minutes left. This is my contact information. I am happy to be a resource, happy to bounce ideas off of. Um, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, reach out with me over email if there's any other questions um, that you or a friend or a family member has that I can help with um, during this time. I am more than happy to, to connect and to chat. And I think we have just a couple of minutes um, to answer any questions. Yeah, feel free to unmute and ask Tony any questions. While I don't really have a question, I do have to say my background is in education as well. I'm Regina. My background is in education as well. So I can appreciate the challenges that are involved here for the parents as well as for uh, teachers. Uh, I especially like your age-appropriate chores. I think that's very useful for parents and, and so on. And setting up those spaces, uh, it's something that we're going to have to think about and build on uh, from here on because we don't know when we'll be back to normal or what the new normal is going to look like as well. So uh, thank you so much. This was very interesting. And I think it's going to um, make a difference. Um, it's, it's certainly an area that we need to continue to explore and work on. Yeah, and that's, you know, this is meant to be a starting point, but it is an area for every family, you know, individually and as a society that we really are going to need to explore and work through uh, sure. because this isn't going away anytime soon. Yeah. Um, and even, even as we do go back to school, if that starts to look like some semblance of normal, that doesn't mean that all the after school programs and everything are going to happen. Um, so still being able to set up spaces for children to be independent, to grab their snacks, to be creative, uh, is going to continue to be important. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, any other questions or comments? Uh, um, yeah, I have a question. question. Um, my name's Jermaine, and I have uh, two kids in elementary school. Um, and they're currently in a public school. Um, I was wondering if there's any good resources um, to start looking at for homeschool co-ops or smaller private schools that might be more likely to have in-class uh, options in the fall. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I know that as a small private school, we will have in-class options in the fall. Um, you can also look at the website, the independent schools of the San Francisco Bay Area, which is the issfba.org, I believe is their website. Um, and that'll give you a, at least a listing of the private schools that you can look at from there and reach out to and, and see who, what other schools plans are. Um, because as the state has released guidelines, it's really up to every school and every community to determine what their individual in-school program is gonna look like. Um, and then as far as homeschooling options, there is a homeschool network. I want to say their acronym is HSC, homeschool, I think it's Homeschool California. Um, I'm pretty sure it's HSC uh, that you could look up or if you just Google, you know, homeschooling, um, homeschooling organization California, you'll find their, their overview as well. And they have a lot of great resources. I do know there are several homeschool charter schools um, that serve the Bay Area. Uh, many of them are, are very full. I know one of them has a wait list of over 400 students already. Um, wow. So this wow. is, yeah, it, it is a pressing need and it is something that a lot of parents are thinking about and looking for. Um, which is where you know distance learning programs like ours are designed to kind of step in and be that middle ground where 
you know, maybe students don't want to or can't return to school for whatever reason, but also maybe parents don't want to take on all of that responsibility and time of developing an entire homeschool curriculum. Um, and so there are several distance learning programs popping up as well. Um, I know of ours for elementary school. I know of Fusion School for, for middle school. Um, um, but there are, you could do a search on those as well. Uh, Andy, did you have something to say? Uh, I did, thanks. Um, I just wanted to also say thank you. Uh, it was a very um, informative and, and really uh, some, good, some good tips um, that you offered, Tanya, so I appreciate all those. And um, I did have a specific question related to our family community. We have a um, relatively big, big age gap with our kiddos, uh, with a two and a half year old tall toddler, and then they have just uh, turning eight, a boy who's um, on the spectrum. Um, and so there's just, I think a lot of the similar tensions that all the households have with kids with different priorities and, and different needs. Um, but uh, it seems to be magnified now, right, with it being, um, being all sort of sharing the house all the time. So just curious if there was any specific um, resources or, um, or tips that, that uh, you might be able to offer. Um, you know, I think as far as tips, it would kind of be similar, you know, what what are the abilities that he has and how can you best help him to be to trust him to be independent and to be um to be helpful around the house you know whether it's starting to give chores whether it's things he can help out with with his sibling um whether it's you know setting aside even 30 minutes a day where hey you two need to play a game or do bubble time or do water time or making sure that there's a structured activity. I find in my house with my kids, my kids are closer together, um, but I find if they have a structured activity or something they're focused on, there's an art project, there's a STEAM project, they're creating something, they seem to get along pretty well, but when they're left to their own devices, sometimes they turn into cats and dogs. Um, yeah. So being able to create some of those spaces um, and activities that are easily accessible for them to do on their own um maybe helpful um good thank you yeah and i know, also know that um parents helping parents has done a lot of work and a lot of webinars and things recently on issues similar to this um so you could check out their their website as well that was uh parents helping parents yep yep they're an organization in san jose okay i think to wrap this up, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day um, to inform us of all these different programs out there. Yeah, it's a big unknown moving into the fall. Yes. Yeah, how the schools are and whatnot, because I did read that thing that came out on the 5th and it, it's left up to I guess the local schools to decide uh, whether they do alternate days, uh, have the smaller classrooms like Tanya said. So wait and see. Yeah, yeah, definitely part of it's a waiting game. I will also add um, that the Thrive Alliance is hosting a webinar on Friday with the superintendent of San Mateo schools. I don't know if it's full yet or not, but I'm hoping to gain some more insight um, a little bit more locally on what they're thinking um, as that information starts to come out. But thank you so much for having me. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. And, for the resources uh, as well, yeah. Yeah, all those resources. So this is recorded, so I will post it out there. Um, if you'd like to send your slide package over, I can distribute it as well, Tanya. Sure, yep, I can send that to you. Okay, great. And what we have up for the rest of this week is we actually have a town hall meeting this Thursday. If you know of any restaurants out there, um, this is a, another app. I know that um, we just have so many different apps to order now, but this one uh, is called Chow Now. They're partnering with the chamber. They're actually commission free. So it's a flat rate monthly. We think that'd be beneficial to many of our restaurant uh, owners to get back out there um, using it commission free because we heard some commissions go up to like 30% of their profit. So um, if we can get people to attend the town hall to learn more about uh, Chow Now, um, any referred restaurant, gets a discount on their setup fee. And then also um, 
the chamber gets a referral fee. So it's kind of a win-win on both sides. So if we, um, that is at two o'clock on Thursday. And then at 10 o'clock on Thursday, we have uh, Shahida Sebadar. She's going to talk about what, why it's important to have a backup plan in place for unexpected events, you know, such as illness. So this is more about uh, living benefits, life insurance. Uh, people don't like to think about that, but it's good to have in place. So thank you everybody for joining us today. And this was successfully live on Facebook. I had some people check. So, Great. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye, have thank a great you. day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.